first thanks a lot uh, for, to the organizers for setting up such a nice meeting. And I'm quite excited uh, to be on the first part of the concerts where the big band is, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, well, talking before Ron is, uh, is quite an excitement. So I feel like, uh, you know, there's the Rolling Stones concert and so I'm the first, uh, the first part of the, of the concert. So now that's uh, for Ron to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to feel good. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me start. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a this is a workshop about mathematics of data, and uh, what I'll be talking about is, uh, with probably no surprise, deep ne uh, deep networks. Uh, more specifically, it will be approximation theory with uh, deep networks, because in this era where uh, of uh, where, where much. Uh, uh, much work from uh, empirical studies, uh, uh, well, starting from empirical studies, is going on, uh, trying to get uh, any type of understanding on the, 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 the properties of uh, networks is, uh, of course, a challenge. Uh, I would uh, maybe uh, start by uh, uh, recapping what's uh, uh, the, 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 the landscape. Uh, a way of thinking about deep networks is primarily, I think, uh, in terms of uh, computational architecture. So it's a computational architecture that's very rich, uh, that's so rich indeed that uh, we can revisit a number of uh, existing uh, flow, uh, workflows, existing frameworks, and uh, re-express them in terms of, uh, of networks. Uh, so if you think about classical uh, 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 flow workflows like uh, that have been uh, engineered over years, uh, uh, you can think of fast transforms. Uh, you can think of iterative algorithms for solving inverse problems. Uh, there's a way of, uh, I mean, it's already known uh, that we can re-implement these, uh, these tools uh, as particular uh, network architectures. So uh, from this point of view, uh, uh, networks are just uh, you know, a way of writing programs uh, uh, for, for computational uh, science. Uh, one of the main, uh, uh, Im the, 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 the main impact of uh, these networks is that not only it's a workflow to implement things, but it's a tunable workflow. So because of the ability to tune parameters of, the, of these networks, uh, it, there's a possibility of somehow industrializing uh, what engineers have been doing uh, for, uh, for years, uh, decades, and centuries, which is uh, well, adjust uh, the, the, the details of uh, the algorithms to a particular context uh, to optimize the performance of the algorithms. So tuning is not something new, but tuning at scale is something that has been made possible not only by the architecture, but also by uh, the availability of large training data sets and large computing resources. So uh, this, so this uh, story of networks really uh, is, uh, is uh, in the line with uh, a long series of, uh, uh, of, uh, of works. And uh, in the, what uh, is remarkable is that uh, the, these uh, Turing awardees uh, have been, uh, 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 who, who, who managed to turn uh, neural networks from, uh, from a nice concept to something uh, really powerful and, uh, and with impact is uh, tenacity. And the, uh, the fact uh, the, the, uh, of, making, of working with large data sets and uh, being able to exploit uh, large computational resources. So of course, uh, this talk will be about more, uh, we'll try to investigate a bit of the mathematics of, uh, of networks. So it will not be so much about optimization. Uh, and the, the focus will be on what we could try to do to, uh, to uh, investigate uh, how to reduce the resources needed by uh, the, the current technology revolving around these networks. Uh, because currently, these networks which implement some, uh, uh, some complex functions, they rely on uh, 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 heavy and, co and costly hardware and a lot of energy. Can we hope to reduce the resources needed uh, to work with them while preserving uh, as much as possible their efficiency? And uh, the idea advocated in, uh, in this talk is that thinking of uh, sparse networks, and so uh, why sparsity? Well, because sparsity. Uh, sparsely connected networks, uh, I could argue that, uh, we could argue that sparsity in networks is a way to account for the number of flops, uh, so the computing power required to, uh, and the time required to apply these, uh, these networks, but also the energy, maybe the, the storage required to describe the networks, and, uh, and of course, also uh, hopefully the, 
the statistical significance of the network, so the number of annotations that are needed to uh, reach a desired accuracy. Uh, so that's the, the spirit of, uh, of this talk, which will in fact be uh, uh, framed in the context of approximation theory. So the idea would be to understand uh, uh, what are the expressivity, re, uh, tra the, the, the trade-offs between expressivity of networks and, the, and their sparsity. So I will start uh, by some uh, general reminders so that we're all on the same, uh, uh, on the same ground with respect to notations uh, uh, with what, what is a neural network uh, what, and what type, the types of uh, neural networks considered in this talk. And then we'll go uh, smoothly to sparsely connected ones and uh, the approximation theory behind it. One of the goals being to understand a bit the role of depth or to recap or, or uh, rephrase a certain existing results on the role of depth in this context of approximation theory. So you're probably all familiar here with uh, a what is a neuron. A neuron is a function, that, I mean, is associated to a function that takes an input vector, d-dimensional, and well, it takes an input vector, multiple, it takes the inner product with a certain uh, uh, vector, adds a bias or an offset, and applies a nonlinearity. The nonlinearity is called activation function or nonlinearity. So that's uh, a neuron is essentially a uh, function from RD to R. A layer now is something that uh, gathers several neurons together using typically the same nonlinearity at each, uh, on each neuron of the layer. And so the, uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the, the affine part that's, uh, the, the, that's uh, used before the layer uh, will be denoted W in the, in the rest of uh, this talk. So a, lay, a layer of a neur uh, neural network uh, first applies uh, an affine transform and then followed by an entry-wise uh, nonlinearity associated to a given activation function. And of course, uh, layers are stacked together uh, to get uh, feed what here a feed-forward neural network. So a feed-forward neural network. Uh, uh, here is something with uh, L layers. Uh, we just have to agree on how we count layers. Do we count nonlinear layers? Do we count linear layers? L, the number of layers uh, in this talk, will be the number of affine layers. And so, they, if, uh, so the most basic neural uh, network with one hidden layer has two uh, layers. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's the description of a network. What is really of interest is the function implemented by the network. Uh, a function can also be called the realization of, an, of a network. So the description of the network is essentially through the choice of the nonlinearity and uh, the nature of uh, the, the, the description of the affine layers. The function itself, the realization, is a function for RD to RK, which is just the composition of uh, affine, and, uh, affine layers and nonlinearities with no nonlinearity in the end. The last layer is linear. That's important uh, in the, because it's, uh, it brings in some, uh, some linearity uh, at, the, at the last stage uh, that's, uh, that, that's used uh, for, the, for many of the analysis. Rho is always fixed and round? Or do you allow we'll, 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 we'll come back to it, but uh, for the moment, let's think of rho as being the same everywhere, but I will change this uh, somewhere in the talk uh, to a little more freedom. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, la, let's say the, 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 basic, uh, the, the basic network here would be with the same row at uh, every neuron, the same uh, nonlinearity at every neuron. This is, of course, a simplified version of what uh, actual neural networks are uh, in practice. And some of the things that I'm not uh, making explicit, uh, that, that I'm not really mentioning here, are, are there's a notion, there are other types of layers. There's pooling layers, where you can aggregate the output of uh, certain uh, neurons. There can be also structured layer, uh, linear affine layers with convolutive uh, uh, structures. So that, let's say this is a special case of these uh, feed-forward uh, networks. And uh, well, there can be also skip connections where the networks are not really layered. They are connections that go from uh, maybe from that layer directly to another, uh, to another one. Uh, but let's uh, keep it simple for the moment if you, uh, if you bear with me. So these networks, networks uh, uh, if we zoom out, uh, a ne neural network uh, can be associated to a set of parameters. And uh, given this set of parameters, uh, it implements a certain function. 
And the goal is, uh, uh, in general, to use this parametric set of functions to fit a target function. In particular, in statistics, you may want to, uh, to uh, fit, uh, to, to do regression. So given an observable variable, you want to fit the expected value of, uh, of an unknown uh, variable. Uh, so there's a training state, etc. cetera. Uh, the, this requires uh, statistics, this re requires algorithms to train the networks that will not be the topic of this talk at all. Here we'll be rather interested in, uh, uh, in the expressivity in how good this approximation can be, uh, in understanding what properties of the right-hand side are needed uh, to ensure that the left-hand side can be a good approximation when we control some budget on the, uh, on the description of the network. So in particular, uh, what we, uh, a goal would be to understand, uh, to better understand what's the role of the architecture uh, what's, you know, what's the graph of the network? Is it wide? Is it, uh, is it uh, uh, thin? Is it uh, shallow or deep? And so also, what's the role of the activation function? What does, it, does it matter if we change the activation function or not? And uh, what's, the, what's the impact? And of course, uh, there's also, uh, there can be an impact of how we count budgets. Do we count neurons? Do we count connections? This, this can have an impact. So since Ron asked a question about the activation function, let's uh, see uh, one of the most popular activation functions is the so-called rectify linear unit. Uh, more, probably more well known in mathematics under the name of positive part. So uh, here, here it is. Uh, why is it popular in practice? Uh, okay. I'm, I don't consider myself as a practitioner of neural networks, but what I've read, heard, and uh, is that the main interest is that the, uh, when you compute the derivative of this function, it vanishes exactly on one side and it's constant on the other side, so that when you use uh, stochastic gradient, I mean, you use the train rule to compute gradients, the gradient either strictly vanishes or remains non-zero, and that's uh, helpful in the gradient descent uh, method. It's probably not the most, uh, the, the most uh, straight, uh, the, the first uh, uh, activation function that comes to mind with respect to the history of neural networks where sigmoid-like activation functions uh, were, were considered. And, uh, but it's not difficult to implement a sigmoid. Uh, using this, uh, this activation function, you can uh, implement an, a sigmoid-like uh, uh, activation function by a simple uh, combination with two, ne two neurons. And with three neurons, you can also implement the hat function. And so uh, it's not difficult with uh, this uh, kind of uh, observation to, to realize that uh, any 1D uh, affine function, piecewise affine function, continuous uh, piecewise affine function, can be implemented with just one layer of a neural network with the red. So in fact, if you think of the functions that are implemented by ReLU networks, networks based on the radio activation function. All uh, the, the functions that you can realize are piecewise, uh, as continuous and piecewise affine. So in 1D, this is the type of uh, functions that you can get. And uh, if you look at, uh, well, on the domain, at what the function you can get in a higher dimension, it's, it's again a piecewise continuous, it's a piecewise continuous and affine. It's a continuous piecewise affine function. Uh, now, what, can, uh, what about the converse? In fact, uh, in, in dimension one, any piecewise continuous affine function can also be implemented as a, as a ReLU network, where the number of pieces is essentially uh, associated to the number of neurons in, uh, in this uh, network. And you only need two layers. You just need one hidden layer to implement any piecewise affine uh, continuous function in dimension one. In dimension two, it's no longer the case. Uh, the the, the net networks, have, if you only use one hidden layer, the functions that you can implement are not compactly supported, and uh, they are not even integrable. So there's a restriction to what you can implement with one hidden layer. However, as soon as you impl uh, when you authorize two layers, uh, uh, you already have uh, more. Uh, you, you can implement compactly supported functions. So the main, uh, uh, 
the, whether you can how many layers you need to implement a, a, a given piecewise affine function in higher dimension uh, is a bit uh, more intricate and depends on the, the connectivity of the underlying uh, uh, boxes. Yes. Uh, so in, if, if the input dimension is one, uh, you can implement compact, comp compactly supported functions in dimension one. With, uh, but, but in, in higher dimension, it's... Uh, yes, you cannot take the product. Uh, yeah, uh, with the ReLU, you cannot take directly the product. You can approximate the product as well as you want on compact domains, but not on non-compact domains. In, in higher dimension, in fact, what, if you have one ReLU, uh, one neuron, you implement a reach function. So it's a, it's a constant uh, on a half space and it's uh, linear on another half space. And if you combine them, uh, y y no way you make it compactly supported. Yeah, you can have to go to the sphere to make this input. Yes, you know, on other, uh, if, if you restrict to other uh, input domains, uh, yeah, there's, there are possibilities. But on RD, no way you get a compactly supported function. So in a way, in dimension bigger than one, you need to go to at least three uh, layers, two hidden layers, uh, to build, uh, if you want to work on the whole space, in the whole of RD. Okay, now, uh, we, as you can see, there's uh, something on whether you, co you consider a compactly supported domain, uh, compact domain or not. And on, uh, in fact, on compact domains, there's a very uh, well-known result, the universal approximation theorem, that's really, on a, any compact subset, if you use any, enough neurons, you can approximate any continuous function as well as you want to arbitrary precision. So that's on a, on a compact domain. And uh, the only uh, assumption you need is something is uh, essentially that your activation function is not a polynomial. Now, uh, what does this theorem tell us? Uh, well, it has something qualitative with one hidden layer on the compact domain. If you have enough neurons, you can get arbitrary uh, uh, accuracy. But how many, what's the relation with, between the number of neurons and the accuracy? Well, this, is, uh, this requires more specific uh, analysis. And there are a number of uh, uh, works, including from many people in this, uh, in this audience, on relating essentially the, the, the rate of approximation depending on how many neurons you use uh, given the, uh, and relating it to the smoothness of, uh, of the considered function. Here, one of the things we would like to do is to work not with the number of neurons, but rather with the number of connections, that, which as I said, is related to the number of flops uh, to compute the uh, output given the inputs. And, uh, and also, if you're not on a compact domain, then you need at least uh, three layers. So let me come back on this notion of uh, sparse connection, uh, using sparse connections. Uh, first, what do I mean by sparse connection? Uh, if you have a neural network with a number of layers, uh, well, well, I'll remind you that theta describes the collection of all uh, affine layers, uh, and as a way of counting the number of non-zero entries in, these, uh, in the matrices involved in these affine layers. So by analogy with what is done in uh, sparse uh, data processing, let's use the L0 norm to simply denote this count of the number of non-zero entries in the description of the network. And we'll say that uh, a, a network is uh, N sparse if the number of connections is not more than N. So here is an example of an, a sparse network. We've got a number of connections. So that's, that's the main image to think about what is a sparse network uh, with, uh, compared to a fully densely connected uh, uh, network. Why is it uh, uh, useful to think about sparsity in this context? Well, because the sparsity here uh, controls the number of uh, multiplications uh, uh, when, when computing the output given the input, so it controls the number of flops. And in a way, uh, if you use quantized uh, uh, weights, if you, if you use, I don't know, floats to, to describe your weight, this also uh, counts, this controls the order of magnitude of the, 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 the number of bits needed uh, to represent, uh, to describe your network, including the architecture. Is there a question? 
And, uh, and, and then there's, also, of course, also uh, some uh, relations that, uh, with, the notion of, with statistical notions like VC dimensions, but they're, uh, they're maybe a bit more intricate and also involve the depth, the width, and, and, and other parameters, which can be controlled by the number of uh, connections, but are not directly uh, uh, driven by the number of connections. An example is uh, in classical digital signal processing, uh, we are familiar with uh, fast transforms, fast linear transforms, uh, and fast linear transforms can be uh, uh, implemented as a sparsely connected network with a simple twist is that you, you use as a nonlinearity the identity, so no nonlinearity no non anywhere, but you can think of, uh, let's say here, the, this is the Hadamard matrix, or you could think of the Fourier matrix. And the fact that you have a fast algorithm to compute the Fourier transform or the Hadamard transform is associated to the fact that this matrix is a product of sparse matrices, of a logarithmic number of very sparse matrices. And this uh, allows you to count uh, the complexity of the fast transform related to the number of connections in this linear but sparsely connected network. Uh, before we go further uh, and actually dive into a bit of approximation theory, uh, I'd like to say uh, a word of caution uh, about the diversity of uh, sparsely connected networks. If you just uh, worry about how many connections there are in a, uh, in a network, I mean, if you just worry, uh, wonder what, is a, what a network can look like when it has n connections, well, there's a variety of shapes. There can be a very thin and, uh, and deep network are a very shallow but wide network. And these probably wouldn't qualify as sparsely connected network in intuitively because uh, here all connections are non-zero. Here all connections are non-zero, but still there's no more than n connection. And that's really what I uh, mean by sparsely connected network here. But of course, in between, when you have intermediate depth networks uh, and intermediate width, then you can allow uh, zero, uh, to, to cut a number of connections and I have something that looks like the figure I showed before. So when I think, uh, when I talk about a sparsely connected network, I, I talk about any of these uh, uh, possible shapes. And uh, the, the question we'll investigate is, uh, you know, what is the richness of expressivity of this family of networks uh, when we increase the number of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the number of connections? So the, the problem uh, that uh, uh, can be f uh, formalized uh, as follows. I mean, you, you're given maybe some domain uh, in RD or maybe the whole, the whole RD and a function that's uh, in LP of this domain. What you would like to understand is how well can I approximate this function by the realization of a network with no more than n connections. So that's the basic problem. And you may also want to constrain it a bit further uh, because you will, say, you will say you will select uh, what's the activation function. Uh, maybe you also constrain the depth of the network because you don't want these very thin networks. Maybe give, for a given budget, you want uh, in terms of connections, you want the the depth of the network to be either bounded or limited by the logarithm of the number of uh, the, of connections. So, yeah. Well, I hide these details uh, and, uh, until uh, it becomes necessary, but. This is the objective. We want to understand what's the trade-off between the budget we allow for the, the approximation and the uh, approximation error. Sorry, is it system or virtual I'm sorry? Is it, is it sorry, is it just the big measure on the whole ambient space? This is the LP on the whole ambient space. Uh, Yes, uh, but I, uh, actually we've only worked with Lebesgue measure, but I don't think that, uh, the, the, that uh, uh, I mean, what matters is the compl is density of certain uh, sets of, uh, the, so you, 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 I think you can adapt this to other measures. Uh, I'd be careful about maybe uh, degenerate cases where you lack density, but uh, so let's think about Lebesgue, uh, Lebesgue space with, uh, uh, for, for these LP spaces. Uh, so, uh, we want to understand, you know, what's, uh, what are these trade-offs between, uh, between uh, sparsity budget for the network and accuracy. One type of result we could expect are the so-called direct estimates. Assume something on your function 
for example, it's smooth in the sub left base of space, or or maybe it has a, uh, it is cartoon like like we are used to do in uh, in image processing for for for, uh, for modeling. And can we derive some uh, uh, some bounds showing that the error decays at a certain rate with the number of uh, connections? This has been achieved uh, to, to for the uh, number of uh, classes. Actually, for many uh, many classes, the optimal rate is known. Uh, this rate is known thanks to uh, notions of width and nonlinear width. Maybe uh, Ron will say uh, a word about about these widths and uh, some of the twists related to. Uh, what are exactly the nature of the algorithms that can be uh, considered, uh, the, the approximation algorithms that can be considered there. So these rates are known. And the good news is that they are achieved by uh, uh, these uh, sparsely connected uh, networks. Uh, you, this, the, the optimal rate is achieved for these function classes. But maybe the not so encouraging news is that, well, the, the rate is not better than the rate with waylets, I mean, it's not a surprise. It's the optimal rate. You cannot hope to improve it, but it's already achieved with uh, classical uh, uh, approximation techniques. And moreover, these classical approximation techniques, they are associated to constructive algorithms to find the best approximants, while uh, for neural networks, it's not, uh, it's not so clear. Actually, you, for these particular cases, the way you get the result is by <laughs> writing wavelets as neural networks, so well, you get a constructive method, but not so that would work, that would be constructive for any function. So it's interesting, but it's a bit uh, also, uh, you know, reformulate, just reformulating things in the realm of, um, of a neural network. So maybe another question that's complementary and that could better show what is the potential interest of neural networks is the opposite. It's going the other way. What do I know of a function if I just know that it has a rate of approximation? So it's the notion of uh, inverse estimate. If I have a function that uh, is approximated at a certain rate by uh, n-sparse neural networks, what kind of smoothness do, do I know, can I infer on, the, on this function? Yeah, can, I, can, I, can, I, uh, can I prove that this implies a certain level of smoothness? Uh, and uh, hopefully, we, we, it will not imply the same uh, type of smoothness as, uh, uh, as originally uh, manipulated with, uh, with uh, wavelet approximation, showing that there's a range of functions that are not well approximated by wavelets and that can be still approximated at a good rate uh, with neural networks. That will show additional expressivity of the class of, uh, of, neural, network, of neural networks. And in particular, for this type of inverse estimate, we, uh, we may wonder about what's the role of the activation function and what's the role of that. So for those in the room familiar with approximation theory, uh, you'll uh, uh, see uh, uh, familiar, uh, familiar tools here. So I'll briefly introduce the notion of approximation space and then state our main results on the uh, uh, on the role, on these, uh, how this approximation space can depend on uh, uh, the, the activation function and the presence of uh, 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 so-called uh, skip connections. So, uh, if you remember, we are wondering, you know, how fast, uh, what was the rate of decay of this type of uh, uh, approximation error? So, a natural definition is. Let's consider the set of all functions in LP such that this rate of decay is n to the minus alpha, and we call it A alpha. Of course, this class depends on uh, uh, a number of things, but uh, I just simplify the notion. Uh, there are finer uh, versions of the class. One thing that is important is also this natural uh, measure of uh, something that will show is a norm, but for the moment, let's just define this quantity for a function. We consider it LP norm plus the supremum of this, so it's a measure of uh, you know, how good is the big, uh, the big O here in this uh, uh, when the function is, is in the class. So of course, it's a priori, this class depends uh, on uh, the architecture of the network, so it can depend on the nonlinearity and it can depend on the depth. And so the larger the class, the more expressive the architecture, the smaller, the less expressive. Here, I'm finally uh, uh, specifying uh, my answer to Ron's uh, question at the beginning. Do I consider a fixed 
nonlinearity at all neurons, or can I change the nonlinearity? And here, well, if you fix the same nonlinearity at all neurons, there's something you cannot directly implement with your architecture. Something that practitioners uh, use a lot, which is uh, what is called, are called skip connections. Connections where you take your, uh, instead of having just weight layers, ReLU, weight layers, ReLU, etc., you have the ability to use the identity to, uh, uh, to bring some layer, several la uh, the, the, the content of some uh, layer, many layers uh, after. And that cannot be directly implemented. It's also used in so-called residual networks. It's also used in new networks. So this is something that what we could call strict networks are not rich enough to uh, uh, explicitly implement. So something we can do instead is enrich the family of networks by allowing uh, each nonlinearity to be either rho, a fixed nonlinearity, let's say the ReLU, or the identity. Then it's not difficult to see that you can implement this type of thing by simply having an identity matrix and an identity, uh, a set of uh, identity nonlinearities, etc. And the first uh, result uh, we get is that under very weak assumptions on, uh, on the nonlinearity, uh, the, uh, the approximation classes we get with these two, these two types of architecture, they're exactly the same. So there's, uh, it's not more expressive to, have, uh, to be in this setting than in this setting. So the two approximation classes are the same, and uh, they, are, they, they fit so well the classical uh, formalism of approximation theory that these classes are indeed non-vector spaces, and that the, the, the norm here is, uh, is, is really a quasi-norm, so with triangle inequality, quasi-triangle inequality, and so on. So because uh, we can identify these two classes, uh, we can choose to work with either of the architectures depending on uh, what is more convenient for the analysis, and we know they're just as expressive as one another. And the, the class in the follow, what follows will be simply denoted A alpha of rho because it depends just on the nonlinearity, but it doesn't matter whether you, you put identity or not. Okay, uh, so this also suggests that somehow uh, if you use skip connections or you don't use skip connections, well, well, it doesn't matter in terms of expressivity, but since it may matter in terms of uh, the ability to train the network, it seems that in practice it has a positive impact in the, uh, in the, 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 the gradient descent algorithms where there's a better propagation of the gradients uh, across layers. Uh, knowing that two architectures give the same, have the same expressivity but maybe one of them is more easy to train uh, may be helpful. Uh, another thing I mentioned, counting budgets. Uh, what's the budget, uh, how much does it cost to have a ne ne uh, given uh, uh, neural network. You can count, there are many results where you count the number of neurons. Uh, here pr we propose to count the number of connections. So you can define uh, the approximation error. I mean, we've defined here the approximation error counting number of connections, but you can also define it by counting the number of neurons. And so this can lead to two different families of uh, approximation spaces. And we can show that these uh, families are intertwined because there's a, there are a relationship between number of neurons and number of connections, but it, they are not on the same scale. Uh, so there's this kind of inter intertwining. So this, uh, this can be used uh, uh, to get results on, the, on these function spaces when you have results on these, maybe by losing a bit on the exponents. And uh, in our work, there's also more specific work done on this other class, but on the rest of this talk, I really focus on the approximation classes, defined in terms of the weights, defined in terms of the number of connections. So these classes, uh, they depend a priori on the nonlinearity, on the activation function. How much do they depend on this uh, uh, activation function? Well, uh, well, there are uh, a few examples where things can go bad if you don't, uh, if you badly choose your activation function. First, uh, some trivial cases. If you take as an activation function something that's affine, then uh, combining affine transform with affine uh, nonlinearities, you only get affine uh, functions in the end. So 
uh, there's very little expressivity. The only thing you may hope to gain is the ability to approximate uh, uh, arbitrary affine transform by sparse uh, uh, products of affine transforms. Uh, same thing with polynomials. If you have polynomials, the only thing you, and you bound uh, the depth, uh, the only thing is uh, you get is polynomials of a certain de bounded degree, so there's limited expressivity. If you don't bound the depth, then, okay, there's a Weierstrass theorem, you can approximate everything, but, uh, but you still, uh, why do it with neural networks? Maybe in terms of complexity, but uh, it's the same uh, family of problems and, uh, with, uh, with polynomials. So these are cases where the activation function is, uh, is too specific and there's lit too little expressivity. There are also cases in the opposite where the activation function is too rich, is too complex, and, and there's too much expressivity. Uh, there's uh, indeed a, uh, a, a nice and uh, surprising uh, work. Uh, I mean, at least the first time you see it, you know, I think it's surprising. Uh, a nice work by Mayorov and Pincus uh, from 99 uh, that show that can, you can build uh, a particular activation function uh, that's, uh, that looks like a sigmoid, that's uh, infinitely smooth, uh, uh, that's uh, analytic, and yet, if you implement, uh, if you're in dimension D, you can define a, a fixed architecture with a fixed number n of neurons that only depends polynomially on the dimension, and by just tuning the weights in the, your neuron, you can approximate any continuous function with arbitrary precision. So it's a sp sort of a uh, space filling curve in the set of functions uh, th that's defined with only a finite, uh, finite uh, uh, number of, uh, of real parameters. So it's, it's quite counterintuitive, but what this shows is that when we think of the uh, number of neurons or the number of connections as counting the budget to code a, a network, we sh should be careful. Coding the activation function also has a cost. The ReLU is something you can really code uh, efficiently. I mean, you can describe the algorithm to compute max of x and, uh, and zero uh, easily, but this activation function cannot be encoded. It has, a, it has infinite complexity to be encoded. So this suggests to restrict to reasonable families of activation functions. And probably the most reasonable family is the family of piecewise uh, piecewise polynomial activation functions. <coughs> because they can also be described with finitely many parameters. So here, uh, if uh, what we can show is that, uh, and there are quite weak assumptions on the, the domain where, we, where approximation is conducted, and on how much we let the depth of the network grow with its complexity. If, in fact, any continuous and piecewise polynomial function of uh, bounded degree R has no more expressive power than uh, what happens if you take the rth power of the ReLU as an activation function. So if you want to take some piecewise continuous uh, uh, activation, uh, polynomial, piecewise polynomial activation function, well, you can as well choose the rth power of the ReLU it will be as expressive. Now, uh, there's actually equality here when uh, the activation function is, uh, is a spline. So when the, you match the, derivat the R minus one derivatives at the breakpoints of your activation function. And there's another interesting result. So, so somehow you can just now focus on this family of uh, uh, activation functions, either the ReLU, the squared ReLU, the cube of the ReLU, but Actually, well, there's, a, there's a, an increase in expressivity when you switch from the ReLU to the squared ReLU. However, when you go to higher power, there's no, no more any gain. There's no gain in expressivity. So somehow, well, the ReLU is the basic one that people are familiar with and, and work with. And the square ReLU potentially brings in some added expressivity. Uh, but maybe this expressivity has to be paid in terms of uh, uh, training, uh, ability to train these networks. So if we summarize, uh, in terms of expressive power, well, on compact domains, there's this, uh, first, uh, if you consider the ReLU, or any piecewise affine activation function, they have exactly the same expressivity. 
So this means that in particular, uh, there's a number of activation uh, functions that people have been considering, like the absolute value used in the scattering transforms of uh, Stefan Mala. So with particular uh, fine linear uh, uh, layers. The absolute value is just as expressive as the ReLU. Uh, soft thresholding, uh, so this, uh, well, the soft thresholding function is piecewise uh, linear with finitely many pieces. It's just as expressive as using the ReLU. And uh, there's also a number of variants of the ReLU. They may, the variants may be important in practice because constants matter in, uh, in, in real engineering applications. But in terms of the orders of magnitude of the approximation, uh, the, the, uh, or the approximation error, the rates of approximation, they're just as expressive as one another. When you say just as expressive, you mean they are exactly equal. they are equal. Yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, uh, if uh, because it's the fine case, and as I said, uh, there's there's splines of degree of the uh, of the same degree as the the, the ReLU, so they are equally uh, good on compact domains. Yes. Actually, since we talk of splines, so so now this applies if all the activation are the same. But now, if if you start designing your activations, let's say within the class of splines. Uh, okay, we didn't work this uh, out explicitly uh, because uh, the resulting preprint is already uh, sixty pages. But yes. uh, uh, if uh, it's it's fairly clear that if. If you change the activation function from a node to another, but that you bound that the number of uh, pieces is bounded, mm -hmm. and that they're all splines, and that uh, I'm not saying b-splines, but they're all splines, and uh, the number of pieces is bounded, the degree is bounded, uh, then the expressivity is not better than uh, with the corresponding half power of the ReLU. That's uh, so again. Uh, Constants may matter in real life, but uh, the, in terms of rates of approximation, it has no impact. And so now if you increase the degree of the spline, as I said, well, if, you, if there's this uh, uh, growth of the depth uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, when the, 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 the complexity of the network increases, well, <laughs> going to the square of the value is sufficient. And uh, so it, you get the same expressivity as with uh, uh, any, uh, any spline with bounded uh, uh, number of pieces. However, what may happen, I mean, it's, it's an open question, is maybe they're harder to train. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe there's a good reason why this uh, squared ReLU is not used in practice, because maybe there's vanishing gradients and exploding gradients. Uh, so this raises a number of questions of whether it's possible to choose activation functions that have this potentially imp improved expressivity, but still, are somehow trainable. And uh, also something I, I mentioned that skip connections, so they, uh, in a, with, I mean, the strict networks versus generalized networks, they have the same expressivity. It's not clear that it's still the case if you have particular types of uh, skip connections like ResNets and, uh, and UNets because they have particular architectures. They, they are no more expressive than generalized networks. Are they as expressive? We don't know yet. How am I doing on time? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll skip this. Just uh, that was uh, the only sort of practical thing uh, in this talk where you can use the uh, one of the uh, positive things about the ReLU is that it's homogeneous and it uh, brings in some uh, equivalence classes of uh, networks uh, that can be used to uh, to speed up and uh, the, the the convergence of uh, certain uh, certain algorithms. But that's all I will say about it. Uh, so now maybe the role of depth uh, in three minutes. Uh, so the role of depth, as I said, with one layer you can implement any piecewise uh, affine function in 1D. The number of breakpoints is related to the, the, the number of neurons. Uh, but uh, for larger, uh, for, for deeper networks, uh, you can get exponentially many breakpoints uh, with, uh, with a given complexity. And a typical example is this SOTUS function, which is used to show that cert certain functions can be implemented by a deep network with, uh, let's say, a linear number of uh, parameters, but are badly approximated uh, by uh, any shallow network. And this type of function is exa exactly the ones we use to uh, uh, relate the function spaces, these approximation spaces, with uh, you know, classical uh, function spaces. 
Here, uh, a first result is uh, actually the one of, uh, essentially the result of Philip Gross and uh, Coasas that I mentioned at the beginning. If a function is in a better space of smoothness uh, proportional to the ambient dimension, uh, then it's, uh, it's approximated well by a neural uh, network with uh, rate alpha, here where alpha is the proportionality factor. And so uh, we get an inverse estimate, which is if uh, you have uh, networks of bounded depth L, if your function is approximated at this rate, then it has some Bezier smoothness. But the Bezier smoothness uh, here is, uh, does not um, involve the ambient dimension. Uh, no, okay, this is valid for dimension one, sorry. Uh, the Bezier smoothness is decreased by a parameter that depends on the depth. So the, the deeper your network, the less smoothness you can expect from the fact that you're well approximated uh, by, uh, um, by a neural network at rate alpha. So this is for dimension one and this is, this is dimension one. And, uh, and now, so for these direct results, I mean, it's essentially your reuse wavelets and express wavelets in, uh, as neural networks. And for this uh, result for d equals one, uh, essentially the, the, the result is, uh, is a counting argument where you use the sparsity of the network to prove that uh, in dimension one you have a piecewise affine, but you count the number of, piece of pieces, you bound it by this, uh, with this expression, and then reuse a result of uh, Benchou Petrushev on a three knot uh, spline approximation to obtain this embedding. You use also SOTUS function to show that you cannot improve this embedding. And so, uh, well, okay, roughly speaking, this says that if you have deeper network, then it allows to, uh, to uh, approximate to some rougher functions, some functions that are less smooth. Uh, when you increase the, the, the depth, uh, this is, uh, you get some, something non smooth. And if you don't, don't have a bounded depth, uh, this space doesn't embed into any phase of space of strictly positive smoothness. So you really get some rough functions uh, in there. Well, something I found surprising in, the, in this process is the, if you look at this uh, uh, counting number of pieces of uh, uh, what you can implement with a sparsely connected network, here there's something where the integer part of half the number of, uh, half the depth matters. So it looks like every two layers something is happening, but it's not every layer. There's a, there, there's a the behavior that I would like to, uh, to further understand. What is this coupling between layers? Is it connected with the fact that you need two layers to have compactly supported uh, uh, functions? I don't know, but it's something that surprised me. Okay, maybe to, uh, I'm about to conclude. Uh, this is the, the, the uh, uh, geometry, I mean, the, the set the theoretic picture. This is LP, and uh, maybe this is, uh, so this is a Bezier space. So this is the set of uh, functions approximated at a certain rate by wavelets. And what we've shown is that uh, uh, with the same rate, radio networks uh, can approximate a larger set. And uh, in dimension, uh, so, the, the other thing, so it's more expressive, but the way you find the best approximant uh, is non-constructive. And uh, also if you look at whether this space embeds in a classical Bezier space, well, there's a limit of uh, what can happen and it's related to certain SOTUS functions, certain uh, bad functions uh, that have little Bezier smoothness. And uh, if you look at this bigger space, uh, uh, the rate of approximation you would get with wavelets is uh, very decreased, or you would need uh, uh, many more wavelets to get the same, uh, uh, the same accuracy. So, uh, okay, I uh, just like to conclude here. Uh, what we try to do is uh, using these approximation theory, uh, theoretic uh, tools uh, to get an understanding of what's the role of the architecture of a neural uh, network of neural networks in their approximation uh, uh, capabilities. And in particular, there's this strict versus generalized network uh, that have the same expressivity. Uh, however, we still uh, have to investigate whether actual architectures involving residual networks or units. Uh, also have the same expressivity or whether it's decreased. The main uh, interest of these uh, tools being that they can be trained efficiently, and this remains to be proved, but this is observed. Uh, the role of the nonlinearity, uh, so we've seen the ReLU, the ReLU squared, they have different expressivity. 
And uh, I find it an interesting challenge to understand whether this increased expressivity can be turned into something concrete and trainable. And finally, the role of depth. Uh, well, okay, yeah, the, 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 it, we've essentially uh, written in terms of uh, function spaces some, uh, some known results that depth increases the roughness of functions that you can approximate. And uh, I want to conclude, I propose to conclude here. You can find details on, uh, on the, uh, in the preprint, and you'll find uh, many more in interesting uh, uh, insights on neural networks or linear neural networks in the talk of Ron that's coming next. Thank you. Thank you.